subscriptions applies at any level once you start creating more than one subscription. And of course, other things in governance that are extremely important are increasing security. You know, make sure that you know you're following best practices, you're doing least privilege access, you're securing resources, and of course you're tracking security issues. My audio is a little bit garbled. Let's see if we can uh, adjust the microphone. Please let us know if that's any better or if it got worse too. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and in addition to the first two, of course, uh, we want to make sure that we minimize outages by preventing external resource deletions. One thing that's really, really cool about the cloud is it's super easy to create new resources. You know, you don't have to go get new hardware to provision things. Uh, it also makes it insanely easy to delete things too. So, you know, great, you got your website deployed into the cloud. Now it's there, you're very agile, of course, and then someone accidentally deletes it. That could cause probably a much bigger problem than than, than you than you would experience previously. And of course, minimizing costs, and we'll talk about some of the risks that you take here uh, whenever you're, when you give access to people to Azure. There are some things that can really skyrocket your budget if you're not careful. And of course, monitoring resources, making sure that, you know, if you have an outage, uh, are you in compliance, are you following best practices, and finally, when I look at governance, it's not just about, you know, covering yourself for, uh, for errors. It's also about making sure that you're taking advantage of the platform. So minimizing errors, increasing your agility, making sure that you're not doing the same thing you did on-prem in the cloud just because that's all you know. You need to always, you know, take advantage of the new tools that you get from being there. So in Azure, we do have a, quite a few tools that, you know, take a lot of uh, new learning to kind of get up to speed on, but these tools make your, basically give you the power to make your environment much safer and much more resilient, which of course is what we're really looking for in a governance scenario. So the very first tool is the Azure EA portal. If you have an enterprise agreement, uh, the Azure EA portal is where you go to provision and create new subscriptions for your organization. You also have Azure Active Directory. Azure AD is where your users and your groups are stored whenever you actually go to um, assign resource or permissions to resources. You have this concept of resource group, and we'll talk about resource groups in a little bit more detail shortly, but resource groups are essentially how you organize the resources you create in Azure. And then you have things like policies, which are extremely important as well, that define what you can and can't do inside of a subscription. Then you have role-based access control, which is very similar in concept, except instead of applying to everyone in the subscription, it applies to um, specific users or groups in a subscription. You also have resource locks that I'll talk to you about a little bit that basically help you with the problem of accidentally deleting your whole environment. Then you have really, really cool services like Operations Management Suite and Security Center that really can help you keep track of these, you know, uh, uh, security issues or, you know, patching or malware or whatever it happens to be at a very large scale. And then, of course, templates and command line are the tools that you'll use to really optimize and automate your environment in the cloud. So let's start with talking about managing an enterprise agreement. And again, if, if you're not an enterprise agreement customer, we're, we're not gonna spend too much time on this, so if, if it doesn't apply to you, just keep, trust me, keep listening, we'll talk about something more useful. But I do wanna make sure that for the customers out there that have an EA agreement, that they start thinking about you know, how, they, how they use it at an organization or organization-wide perspective before they go too far and have to backtrack. So the very first thing you should know about the EA portal is you can access it through ea.azure.com, um, and this is basically it's a separate portal than the Azure Management Portal, and it's designed to allow you to create departments and subscriptions um, that kind of model after your organization. So a couple of things that you can do is you can establish cost centers and quotas, and this is you know, if I have a department here and a department here, and they're each paying their own bill, it's what I can do to actually make sure that I can go back and bill them after the fact for what they use in Azure. And without the EA portal, um, there's of course third parties, but if you're not an enterprise agreement customer, there's really no tools out there that'll aggregate this kind of data for you without going to one of the third party solutions like Cloud Cruiser or New Insights or something like that. Uh, so they do give you enterprise-wide consumption reporting, uh, definitely a very valuable tool. It's definitely not the end-all be-all. Uh, we built our cloud sandbox because of some of the things that's missing here, so if you're interested, definitely ping us about that. Now, um, once you're in the EA portal, there's a couple of things you should know. You have the enterprise admin role, and the EA admin role is the Uber end-all be-all. They, they can create departments, they can create account owners, they can create service administrators. Everything you can possibly do in the EA portal, that role is the one that can do it. 
Then you have the department admin role. The department admin role is uh, delegated by the enterprise admin for a specific department, such as finance or marketing or whatever. And the key thing about the department admin on down is they can only view the charges they incur in the EA only if the enterprise admin actually allows them to do it. But at a, at a department admin level, you can actually go create accounts. You can create subscriptions, everything that you need to do to actually use Azure. You just may not be able to see how much you actually spent, which is kind of an oddity. Now, whenever you're setting up your EA, there's a couple of different um, approaches you can take. You can take the functional approach, which is you know, probably the most traditional. I'm an enterprise, I have the marketing department, the finance department, and inside of there, I'm gonna hopefully, probably delegate some permissions from the enterprise to each of the, the departments. Maybe I have a finance admin and a marketing admin, and they're responsible for the consumption in Azure for that whole department. And below the department, you have the account owner, and the account owner is actually someone that can create Azure subscriptions. They may be the same person as a department admin, or they actually may not, depending on how you want to delegate uh, permissions. And then you have the business division model, which is instead of splitting it up by department, you actually split it up by actual business function. So maybe these are the, the business, you know, the departments that are responsible for auto and aerospace. And in that case, you know, aerospace might have its own finance and marketing department as part of it. Then, of course, you have geographic. Um, geographic could be, you know, this is all my North America users, all my Europe users, et cetera, et cetera. And again, how you model this is completely up to you. Uh, you should just know that it's probably a really good idea to think of this ahead of time before you really get into building on your, uh, building out your EA, because ultimately you're going to want to be able to use this from a reporting mechanism for planning and uh, forecasting. Now, a um, couple other options. I'm gonna, not going to spend too much time in here, but in your EA portal, you can change the authentication level, which means you know whether you're only going to accept accounts from your Azure Active Directory, whether you're only going to do Microsoft, or whether you're going to do a little above. Uh, and you can also disable or enable the mar Azure Marketplace. So maybe you do want your users having access to you know Barracuda, for instance, or maybe you don't. Completely up to you, and at an enterprise level, you can control that. Uh, there is a nice user interface for adding departments. The thing that's interesting about departments is whenever you add one, you can give them a cost center and a spending, spending quota. And the cost center is basically the number that you're going to use if you do need to do cross-organization chargebacks. And once you establish your departments ahead of time, you can get really nice reporting that tells you which cost center is spending which amount of money. And this is why it's important to plan this up front because if you go in a year later, all your previous reporting is not going to match up to what you want. Um, the other thing here is the spending quota. Keep in mind the spending quota in your EA is not a hard quota. And so in this example, we have $120,000. If they exceed $120,000, everything still works. Uh, you're not going to get shut down, which is a really good thing. You certainly don't want to accidentally put a too small of a quota and have your entire company shut down. Uh, what it will do instead is it'll email the uh, enterprise admin and the department admin, if they're enabled, that they've exceeded their quotas. Um, and again, the, the sandbox solution that we built is total opposite of this. It's designed for hard quotas, which is if you if you do need to deprovision everything in that subscription whenever you hit an expiration date or a spending quota, it'll actually take care of that for you. One's meant for production, which is EA, and the sandbox is meant for non-production, like dev test and training. That's that's kind of the difference between these two approaches. Now, of course, you also have a UI for adding a new subscription. Whenever you create a new subscription, it is going to provision it within your Azure AD tenant if you're doing this within the EA portal. And, of course, you have consumption reporting, uh, so based on how much you spend by department, by account, by subscription. And, of course, you can also by, uh, enable the department admin or the account owner. By default, those are disabled, though. They cannot actually go in and see. And this is kind of a quick example of what your reporting looks like. And basically the green number is how much of your EA commit that you're, uh, you've com you're using. And once it goes into red, and I'll show you my demo because my EA was clearly way too small, but I'll show you a real quick demo and you'll actually see the red. And the red number is once you've hit how much you pre-committed with your enterprise agreement, you'll actually start over consuming. So let me do a real quick tour of the EA portal. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it's, it's very helpful if you've never seen the EA portal to kind of see it with your own eyes just once or twice so you know what kind of what uh, your customers are talking about if you happen to be there. And as you can see, this is a, this is a, we bought a very small EA agreement, really specifically just so we can do training on it. <laughs> so uh, as you can see, we, we blew away our cap the, the second month. Uh, so the rest of this is basically the overconsumption of 
of how much Azure we're spending for, for doing this. And you can literally break it down and uh, see which service you're spending all your, your money on, whether it's SQL, it's CDN, or storage, or whatever. And um, from here, you can go into Power BI, which will give you much more detailed uh, view of how much you're spending. You can download your usage. If you want to see the individual pricing components for how much you're spending on your EA, you can dive into the uh, price sheet. From a management perspective, you can also go in and add users as depart as a EA admins, and then you can go into department and add them individually as well. So the configuration for the EA portal is relatively simple. You can configure you know the marketplace and uh, enable people to view your usage, and from here you can go into departments, accounts, and subscriptions. So we do have a question, and the question is, uh, the department of spending limit, is that only the assigned by subscription and or subscription admin, or can that be extended to RBAC2? And again, the spending limit for the EA portal is only a notification. There's, there's, there's no kind of restriction or anything. It's, it, all it really does is if, if this department has hit their spending quote, it'll send you an email. Um, so, it, so in that case, it, it really doesn't get any more granular than that with the EA portal. Uh, with our sandbox, it's actually at the subscription level. So you can set a quote at the subscription level, and uh, once you hit the limit, it'll actually shut everything down. And right now, we're doing it at the subscription level, uh, but we're actually thinking about extending it out to individual users and groups too. Though. So that's a, actually a really good point because it's a, probably a good feature request for us. Okay, so let's flip back to the slides real quick, and we'll talk a little bit about organization. So organization within a subscription is probably just as important as organization at the EA level. Uh, and if you only have one subscription, it's probably way more important. So the very first thing I'm going to talk about is why you should worry about resource organization in the first place. And the reason is, is several reasons actually. The first one is from a resource management perspective. If you start using things like templates and PowerShell and stuff like that, they have a deployment target. Whenever you deploy a template, it doesn't just deploy a VM, it deploys a VM to a specific thing, a container, which is the resource group. And the resource group is really the key feature in Azure that you're going to organize your resources by. So as you're talking about building out templates to deploy you know, a SharePoint farm or SQL or whatever it is, is you happen to be, just remember that the target of a specific template is a resource group. So that needs to always be in the back of your mind as how you're, uh, you're considering building these out. In addition to that, security boundary is another really, really important factor for resource organization. Um, if I want to grant everyone access to um, you know, 10 different VMs, if they're all in the same resource group, and of course they share the same life cycle, like the deployment boundaries I mentioned, that makes perfect sense to give them access to the resource group level itself, because everything inside there will, be, will inherit that permissions. Uh, but again, if you don't want to do it, you can actually go it at the resource level, and I'll show you a demo of that in just a few minutes. Uh, but Beyond just resource management and security, you also have billing scope. Whenever you're looking at your Azure subscription bill, you can actually see the resource costs that are rolled up by the resource group itself. So if you want to know how much a specific solution costs, as long as the components for that solution are all in the same resource group, you can actually group, all, group them all and figure out how much you're actually spending on that one specific thing. And there's also the tags, and I'll explain what a tag is in just a moment, but basically a tag will allow us to provide a further grouping on top of resource groups that gives you very, very good flexibility for billing and resource organization. So whenever you think in this room, um, what I like to do is I like to think of resource groups as basically as long as they share the same life cycle. And when I say life cycle, I mean if, they, if I was going to delete everything in that resource and not affect something else, it probably should be in the same resource group. And here's a real quick example of how I would uh, kind of explain that is in this, this resource group, or in this slide, we have basically four different resource groups. One of them is shared infrastructure. This is where we have our virtual network that probably multiple applications will use. We'll have shared storage maybe. Maybe I have a bunch of file shares that a bunch of different applications are using. And then I have um, two resource groups for an application in HR. Maybe one of them is production and one of them is dev. So probably the production one doesn't get deleted, but the dev one, if it was me, I would, you know, if I wanted to go do a test of that, I would deploy it test, write some code, then I delete it when I'm done, so I have to pay for it. So clearly we don't want them in the same resource group because you certainly don't want to delete your production resource just because you deleted dev. 
And procurement, of course, is a standalone here, but it doesn't have anything to do with these other resources. So just like the two HR apps, we would want them in their own separate resource group. And as long as you think of it from a lifecycle perspective, planning your resource groups would make it is much easier. Now, resource group tags are, uh, I'm sorry, as a resource tags are different. Basically, a tag can be applied at a resource group or a resource level, and you can apply up to 15 tags per resource. And what these are for is to give you an, an additional line of taxonomy that you can put above a resource group or above a resource. For instance, if I wanted to tag everything that's in my entire subscription, whether it's production or development, I could put a tag on there called environment. And if I go query by that tag, I'll see everything that's production and everything by dev. doesn't matter which resource group it's in. So that's really, you know, if you think about it that way, that's really where tags come in. The beauty of tags is they also roll up to your build too, though. So not only can you see group your bill by, you know, the actual resource group, they can also gr group it by your tags. So if you want to see how much you're spending on dev test, you can absolutely do that by using tags appropriately. Uh, from a tag perspective, there's three different ways you can look at tags. You can go into the Azure portal. You can actually just click the tag you're interested in. It'll show you all the resources. If you want to use them programmatically, you can use PowerShell or the CLI tools, and they'll basically give you the same thing. So you can think of maybe I want to find everything with um, you know, a certain IO code and shut it down. Or maybe I want to find everything that has a, that's tagged with production, or maybe not production, but development, and delete it. And it's really easy to do that once you're using uh, the command line. And this is a real quick example of what your bill will, your individual Azure subscription bill will look like once you um, look at the resource group or the, at the tag level. And again, this is just a spreadsheet, so you can um, pivot, you can move it around, you can look at however you want it to. So question, is tagging on a resource group inherited to the objects in the resource group? An example, if I have several resource groups tagged as that production, can I request all network adapters? And unfortunately, you cannot. You have to tag the resources themselves, too. It's a resource group and also the resource whenever you're applying tags, which is another good reason to get really good at PowerShell or templates. Okay. And moving on. Now, one, one thing that's really good is if you have not uh, set up resources correctly in the first place, this actually used to be a really big deal, uh, but if you haven't, if you did it poor, incorrectly the first time, you can actually move it now. Uh, so most of the resources that you create in Azure can actually be moved between resource groups. Uh, the trick is, of course, they have to be within the same Azure AD tenant if you want to move them between subscriptions. Um, but, you, you know, in the same subscription, it's super easy. You can literally just use a portal to move them back and forth. All right, so uh, one other feature I want to talk about is policies. Policies are uh, a very important feature that allows you to uh, figure out which resources or configurations are available at the subscription, the resource group, or even the resource level. Some kind of uh, things that you can do with policies are uh, the regions that are supported, I want to enforce a naming convention, I want to say supported services, like maybe I don't want to enable HD Insight in this subscription, maybe I only want to enable, you know, standard storage not premium, whatever you want to do, um, for the most part, is enabled at a policy level. Role-based access control is very similar to policies, you can do almost the same things, you can enforce um, access, not necessarily things like uh, naming conventions, but you can do a lot of the same things, but the difference between the two at a fundamental level is role-based access control applies to individual users or groups, not to the subscription as a whole. So you can do very similar things between the two, but just think that policies don't care who you are. Even if you're an owner, if you own everything there is a subscription, once a policy is applied, it applies to you too, unless you, of course, modify the policy as the admin. Can you rename resource groups is another question, and unfortunately the answer is no on that one. All right, so let's see. Now, we've been talking about resource groups and resources. Uh, let's talk really quickly about what a resource actually is because this is a pretty important topic when you're doing RBAC or policies. Uh, resources are basically things that are defined in a resource provider. There are such virtual machines, storage counts, network interfaces, et cetera, et cetera. Whenever you apply policy or RBAC, role-based access control, you are applying it to resources. You can get the list of resources and their types by using PowerShell or CLI tools. You can also get these out of the portal, too, using a, a 
tool called Resource Explorer. And basically this is how whenever you're writing these policies, you kind of get the, the, the metadata you need to actually define what they are. Now, every resource has a list of operations. So whenever you're thinking about what you can uh, restrict with, say, policies, for instance, right? if I wanted to write a policy which means I could uh, update, I could uh, read a virtual machine, but I could delete it, you're going to need to look at the operation supported for that specific resource, and that is using the get Azure ARM provider operation command line. And this is all about getting the metadata needed to write a policy. Okay, so let's jump out, and we're going to do a really quick demo. So I'm going to flip over to the Azure Management Portal. And the very first thing I'm going to show is really just, you know, what is a resource group? If you've never created one, um, it's relatively straightforward. What I'm going to go to is go under more services. I'm going to type in resource groups. And essentially, once I go in here and I'll click add, I give it a name. I'll just call it myRG. I can give it the subscription I want to deploy it to and the location. And the location of a resource group is kind of important, but not really. It's really just where it's located at because any resource you create in your subscription in any region can also actually go in the same resource group, even if it's in a different region. So we'll go ahead and create that resource group. And as you can see, there's nothing in our resource group right now. So if I wanted to add things to it, um, I could do that. I could go create virtual machines or web apps. And basically, any anything I do inside that UI is going to automatically default to going in this resource group. But if I go create a resource outside of the resource group, I can actually select it. There will be a drop down here too. So it's relatively easy to cre create the containers and to basically kind of um, you know make sure they're they're organized in the right way. So what I want to show next though is I want to show a resource that resource group that has something in it. So I'm going to expand out more resources, and I'm going to go down to SQL, and I have a SQL database that I've created called SQL DB, and if I look in the resource group, you can see basically what all it has. Um, in this case, it's going to have the, the SQL database name itself, and it's going to have the SQL database server that it's tied to, and this is basically um, what it looks like whenever you're looking at a resource group view and you have multiple resources to move these, like if I deployed them to the wrong resource group, I can click move. I can pick the resources and I can pick the resource group I want to move it to. And what this little pop-up is, what this little uh, disclaimer is telling me that if I have any PowerShell scripts or something that are assuming it, it's in the SQL DB resource group, they're no longer going to work once I click OK. Okay, so while we're waiting for the move, I want to answer another question, and that question is how do we recommend um, merging subscriptions if they basically did this wrong in the first place? And uh, <laughs> definitely not an easy challenge, but it is doable. Um, basically, just like how I'm moving resource groups here, I can move uh, resources between subscriptions. The To move between subscriptions, they do have to be in the same Azure AD tenant, and I'm, it, it's been a while since I've looked at the documentation, but there's probably a difference between which resources can be moved between resource groups and subscriptions. Whenever they first introduced a feature, there were things like virtual network gateways that couldn't be easily moved, and um, I don't know if that's still the case, but if it is, and really that's probably the biggest problem you're going to run into is if you if if moving gateways, express route circuits are not supported yet, that might be something that you might have to rebuild as part of that consolidation process. But other than that, you can actually move it very similar to uh, different resource groups, as long as both subscriptions are part of the same Active Directory tenant. Okay, so our move is going on, and we can come back and check this here in just a little while. And while I'm while I'm doing that, I want to show another uh, thing real quick. And this is role-based access control. Um, double check that. Actually, I'm not going to show role-based access control yet. That's next. <laughs> getting ahead of myself on my demo. Uh, so we'll come back and check out whenever the move is complete to make sure it actually does um, move it to the right resource group. So while we're waiting on that, let's talk really quickly about role-based access control. So role-based access control uh, defines who can perform what actions on what resources. 
So essentially you're working with users and groups and these are added to roles that are in your subscription. And once you add them to a role, they're defined or they're applied to a subscription, a resource group, or a resource level. And essentially access is inherited from the parent resources. So any RBAC policies that you apply at a resource group level apply to everything in that resource group. And likewise, if you apply it at a subscription level, it's applied to everything in subscription. Now then one thing you do need to know is those users or groups don't just magically appear, they come from Azure Active Directory. So if you're using Azure AD for your directory store, maybe you have it federated with uh, your on-prem Windows Server Active Directory, this is going to be the same users and groups that you manage today on-prem, you can manage them in the cloud as well. You can of course also have a cloud-only Azure AD environment, and at that point you're going to be managing access to those users and groups inside your Azure subscription. So just keep in mind that every subscription that you create in Azure is associated to one and only one Azure AD directory. So that's always going to be where it gets its users and groups from. All right, so from a roles perspective, there are a couple of built-in roles, actually three built-in roles. Actually, I take that back. There's like 100 built-in roles, but there's three core built-in roles that are not specific to a resource. Uh, the three core roles are the owner role, contributor, and the reader role. The owner role basically allows you to do everything within Azure. Maybe not Azure AD, keep in mind the permission models between your subscription and Azure AD are completely different. But if you're an owner in your subscription, at the subscription level, you can do everything there is to do. If you're a contributor in the subscription or a resource group, you can do everything there is, except you can't change rollback or RBAC permissions. You also can't change policies. So keep that in mind. Contributor can delete everything, but they can't invite someone else to come in and delete everything. And of course, a reader can just read. Now, uh, there's also probably 80 to 100 plus other roles that are defined very specifically for like web apps, virtual machines, HD Insight, and they all are very specific, uh, specific to what they can do with that specific resource. These are broad roles that apply to everything. Um, now, the thing to understand about RBAC is they are applied to a scope. So they're applied at the subscription level, a resource group level, or even an individual resource. Now this is a, what I mean by specialized in resource specific roles. You have things like Dev Test Labs user, Key Vault contributor, and you can also create custom roles. So if you want to make a, if one of these 80 plus roles doesn't work for you, you can make your own very custom one that does exactly what you want using the metadata um, extractor from PowerShell or the Resource Explorer. And again, res uh, scope and access is inherited whenever you use an RBAC. So if you apply owner, contributor, reader at this level, they're gonna be owner, contributor, reader all the way down unless it's specified somewhere else below. And if owner is specified here, it's always gonna overwrite that. Now if you do wanna look at what a role is, and this is if you ever wanted to create your own role, uh, a role basically consists of the name, it has its own unique ID, has a description, has a property that says whether it's custom or not, and it has different scopes you can assign it to. Now, why would you have assignable scopes? That's kind of an interesting idea. And the reason is, is so you don't see all of those roles everywhere you go. If you create you know, your own custom roles, it might only be applicable for a specific resource group. And you can make it assign that here, and it'll only show up in the UI for that specific resource group. And then, of course, for the rest of the role, you have actions, which are things they're allowed to do, and not actions, which things are not allowed to do. So you can basically go in and exclude a whole swap of things, and whatever's left, you can do or you can actually spell it out specifically in the actions list. You can create custom roles, and whenever you create the custom roles, these are really designed if you can't find something else that just makes more sense. Uh, they're very granular in nature. You have to define exactly what they can and can't do, and this, all these things come from Resource Explorer or from the PowerShell by looking at the resource provider and the types. So let's take a real quick look at role-based access control. So what I'm gonna show you is um, first of all, I'm going to go into Azure Active Directory, and if you haven't used Azure AD lately, uh, they have finally moved this to the new portal. It's in preview, uh, which means if you've used it before, you don't have to go to the classic portal anymore for um, to do things. We can literally go into users and groups inside the new portal with all users, and the reason I'm doing this is because I have a user account here, and I don't remember what its name is. So, um, there we go, BU Admin User. It's a name that I'm interested in. This uh, demo account that I'm going to use. And what I'm going to do with this user is I'm going to apply permissions to uh, one of the virtual machines in this SharePoint farm. So this is something I provisioned before the, the start of the webinar. And you can see we have three virtual machines. Well, 
Yeah, there they are, three virtual machines, availability sets, load balancers, all that good stuff. And what I want to do is I want to make this user be able to manage my Active Directory domain controller. So I'm going to go into this user, or to this VM. I'm going to go into Access Control. And I'm going to add this user to the owner role because I really want them to admin it, not just partially. And you notice it's pulling from my opsdildy.com directory. So I'm adding this user as an admin. And now, whenever this user logs into the portal, they should be able to manage this VM. So I'm going to go into another browser. And this is logged in as a business user, user admin. And you can see that I have two resources because I think I've done this demo already. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a virtual machine extension. Okay, it's very good. So I'm opening up my virtual machine. And as you can see, that's the only resource this user has access to um, is the VM and the extension port to install the domain controller. Now, what's interesting, though, is if I go to things like network interfaces. Now, if I look at network interfaces, it's going to load slowly. Well, eventually it'll load, but once, once it does load, one thing you'll note is this user does not have access to, cannot read a public IP, private IP, and actually that might be why it's taking a long time to load. And the reason is, is because role-based access control is extremely granular, which means if I'm looking at these resources over here in the other portal, I granted access to the virtual machine itself, but not to the load balancer for SharePoint, not to the availability set, not to the network adapter. So they can't see any of those things. Um, so keep that in mind whenever you're building these things out is, you know, it's not just a VM or it's not just, you know, the SQL database, it's the SQL database server too. It's all these resources that are associated with it. So if I wanted to do this, uh, really let the user add it, I would have to add that user to the resource group or to all the individual resources. Okay, so let's talk real quick about resource manager policies. And resource manager policies, uh, these are, like I said, these are very similar to RBAC in a way, but instead of applying to a user group, they apply to the subscription as a whole. Um, they're basically uh, define what you can do in the subscription and give you some control over, you know, some actions you can actually take. Uh, they're defined by uh, you create a JSON file, you register it with the system as a policy definition, and then you apply it at the subscription or resource group or even at the resource level at, um, as a policy assignment. So some of the use cases for policies are detailed chargeback. For instance, if I want to do, um, like I think someone asked earlier, uh, whether a tag is at the region level or the, or the resource or the resource group level, I can actually have a policy applied that will automatically apply that tag to every resource in a resource group automatically, but it does take a little bit of work to make that happen. Another use case for this is controlling what services can be created and also controlling which regions they can be created in. If in your organization you've determined that West US and East US are all you ever want to deploy, you can actually create a policy that will restrict everything else. Uh, other things like enforcing a naming convention, so maybe you always have um, you know, OPS as the startup name of your resource groups. Something like that you can absolutely do. And of course, uh, supported SKUs. So maybe I want to make sure that no one can do the SQL Server Enterprise Edition image because it costs a lot of money. And we already have the licenses. You can restrict that um, by using policies. So real quick, what a policy definition structure looks like. Uh, basically, every policy you create will have a condition. And this is uh, something like um, you know, an if statement, and in this case, it's, you know, we're checking the tags field and see if it has a key call cost center. If it does not have a key call cost center, then we're going to return deny, which will basically, the error, the user will get an error. And keep that in mind, if you want to enforce tags using policies, effectively that means they can't use a portal anymore. So just an FYI, it sounds really great until you try it. And because you can't create resources with tags in the portal just yet. Um, whenever you're defining these conditions, you have basically some key logical operators. You have not and an or. 
and you also have some conditions like equals, like, contains, in, and contains key. As you can guess, these are for different value, uh, different data types. So equals is really comparing strings or integers. Like is basically doing a string search. Contains is very similar. In is basically looking inside of an array. And contains key is if you needed to look inside, looking for a specific value in a, or a key in a hash table. So it all depends on the property that you're querying whenever they create a resource or a resource group on how you want to write your policy. Uh, so some of the things that you can do. Uh, for instance, in my condition, if it, it returns true, I could deny. I could append, which means I could actually add some additional fields to the request. And that's where that uh, cost center, um, where that adding a tag comes in, is using the append operation. Or I could also just audit it. Maybe every time someone creates a really, really expensive G5, I want to audit it so I can go back and ask them what they're doing, why they, why they think they need such big hardware. I can do that, but not block them. Uh, so, you know, these are some of the examples of, you know, what the effects look like. So deny and audit are super simple. You just affect in the name. And if you want to do a, ta a pin, you have to tell it actually what you want to add. Like in this case, we'd want to add the, uh, a cost center tag and call it my department if, they, if this policy actually applied. So once you uh, do this, you can, of course, register the policy in Azure Resource Manager using PowerShell or the CLI tools right now. There's no portal support just yet, but I'm sure it's probably in the works. And then you can apply that policy to the applicable scope. For instance, if we wanted to apply it at a resource group, we would have define a variable that has a subscription ID and the name of the resource group, and then we'd actually apply that definition that we created in the last slide at that scope, and of course, give it the name. We can also use, uh, there's, there's two different ways to find out if people are hitting your policy, like if they're failing, you can use PowerShell using the get Azure arm log commandlet, or there's a new UI in the portal called monitor. If you use monitor, you can actually go and see all the failures that fell from policies. So it makes it easier if you want to just go in and get a visual, visual cue for it. And of course, uh, once you start experimenting with policies, one of the key things you'll need to know is how to remove it once you've experimented with it. And that's also through PowerShell using the remove Azure arm policy assignment commandlet. Uh, one thing to understand about policies is how they get overridden. So um, if you are the enterprise owner, say you created a subscription and you wanted to own that subscription, uh, you can also apply a policy at resource groups below you, and you can also grant other users owner permissions at that resource group. And as long as they don't have owner permission at the subscription level, they can't override your policy that you set. So as a best practice, you can definitely do this and still grant users owner permissions as long as they're below the subscription level and they can't go back and just basically override your policy. Let's do a real quick demo and just, uh, I'm gonna walk through and show a couple of policies just so you kind of know what they look like and how you can apply one. So, and what we have here is we have a couple of JSON files. We have a bunch of JSON files actually, but I'm just gonna show these three. And these are JSON files, so just be warned if you're wanting to set up policy, the very first thing you're gonna have to know is how JSON works. So definitely a, definitely a good skill to have if you're starting to your career in Azure, though, that's for sure. So the very first policy I'm going to show is service catalog. And what this one is, is basically a real simple policy that says if whenever you create a resource, if it doesn't match one of these providers, then deny. That's all it does. Um, so this is how you can do things like, you know, canceling out HD Insight or you know, Document DB. If that wasn't a supported product in your subscription, you can actually keep your users from creating it. Uh, this is one that I would probably recommend everyone use, just be on the safe side. Um, this is going to restrict people from use creating an express route circuit because the only people that need to create an express route circuit are the people that are going to be wiring it up to level three or Equinix or whoever your partner is. If any user goes and creates an express route circuit and it's not connected for whatever reason, they just want to see what it looks like, that's pay for it. And if you're an express route user, you probably know that this can be pretty expensive if you do it incorrectly. And another example is how you would restrict regions. And these are just very short samples. There's hundreds and hundreds of other variations of how you could do the same thing. Now, if you wanted to do Paul, uh, see how this actually works, uh, real short PowerShell script, and uh, short by my definition, I'm sure if you're not a PowerShell guru, then it probably is long, but I'm not gonna go through it all in minutia. But essentially, the structure of deploying this is, you know, if you wanted to apply these policies at a resource group level, you would define the variable um, 
what your resource group would look like. And if you're not familiar with that syntax, I'll show you real quick what the output is. Basically, what that variable will look like at the end, whenever the script runs, is that. Well, I don't have a subscription ID, sorry. We'll do that one more time. And there we go. That's basically how you scope a policy. Once you do that, you will need to define the path to your JSON files, create the policy definition, and assign it to the scope that you're interested in applying the policy at. So relatively straightforward and definitely highly recommended for any enterprise uh, deployment. A couple other things I want to show is lock security and auditing. So resource locks are a very valuable tool if you deploy a production web server or whatever, and you want to make sure people don't accidentally delete it, whether it's from PowerShell or the API or whatever, you can basically apply a lock, and you can apply it at the subscription, resource group, or resource level, and if someone goes and tries to de uh, delete it, they'll fail, and they have to manually go override the lock before they can delete. It's purely for accident prevention. And like I mentioned earlier, if you want to see what's failing, what's working in your, in your organization, you have operation auditing. And this is basically, you can go in, you can filter by resource types, by user, what they did, what failed, what worked, and you can get a full view of everything that's going on in your subscription. You can export it to CSV, and you can you know, filter to your heart's content. And if this is something that's relatively new in the Azure world, if you have not seen Azure Security Center, I highly recommend it. Azure Security Center is basically a service that's there by default. You can, of course, like everything else in Azure, you can pay more and get more features, but by default, you get some really good ones. Um, so some of the key things that Azure Security Center does is it allows you to gain visibility and control, and I'll show you what I mean by that, but by default, it'll look at all the resources you have, like VMs and SQL databases and stuff, and it'll tell you obvious things that you might have forgot, like maybe I didn't do network security groups or enable encryption or, you know, have a, a malware installed on my VM, and it detects that automatically, and many of the things it can do, it can actually pro uh, remediate for you. So it can literally go in and turn on encryption for your databases if, if you want it to. And it also does some cool integration with partner solutions. So if you, you, know, you want to deploy a web app firewall from Barracuda, it can do that for you. And if you pay a little bit more, you can turn on some of the built-in analytics, the machine learning algorithms that the service offers, and you can actually have it detect cyber threats and attacks on your infrastructure for you automatically. So I'll flip back over and show you real quick what Security Center looks like. It's just one of those things that if you don't know about it, it's really neat to know it's already there. So this is a basically a security center, and you can go in and if you really are curious what it's what it's trying to uh, detect for you, you can go into the policy, see what it's looking for. Um, you can configure the email notifications if it detects something. You can detect whether uh, tell it whether you wanted to look for SQL auditing or not. Uh, and if you want, you can go into things like recommendations. And in this case, it's just saying provide my security uh, contacts. So basically, I, I deployed things a little too fast, so I don't have anything for it to detect. But normally, if you go on the security center, right here in this resource security health, it'll actually tell you that you know maybe your SQL database uh, needs to have um, um, transparent data encryption enabled, and it'll let you walk through and do it. So I highly recommend if you have things deployed in Azure today, open up Security Center, go to this tab, and see what it looks like, see what it's telling you uh, you're missing. Some of it may make sense, some of it may not, but ultimately I think you'll probably get a decent amount of value out of it. Actually, see, it popped up already. So we could literally go into our virtual machines, and it could tell us, um, I don't know if it's going to tell us anything useful yet or not. I think it's just telling me that it's still initializing data collection. But essentially, that's a workflow you'll get whenever it's giving you a warning of some kind. Now, we have a few more topics I want to make sure we get in our time allotted, and this is best practices. So, in general, whenever you're thinking about Azure subscriptions and best practices, make sure that you start with policies. You definitely don't want that user accidentally creating an Express Route subscription and racking up a $50,000 bill before you have time to notice it. And it can happen. So, this is something that, you know, you always got to put in perspective if, if you accidentally spend $100,000 because you didn't have a policy, who gets in trouble? You know, you are the person that did it, or maybe you are the person that did it, or someone's going to be mad. And that's basically the way you should look at this. Um, the other thing is, of course, make sure that you are taking advantage of role-based access control. You shouldn't allow everyone to be an owner. Just, you know, by simple definition, people should have the permissions they need to accomplish their, their role, and that's it. After that, 
uh, what I would recommend if you're an enterprise at least, if you are provisioning uh, subscriptions out of part of your EA, write a PowerShell script to apply this. You don't have to go back and do it every time um, manually. Write a script that will apply your enterprise-wide policies and role-based access control, and you can automate this as part of your onboarding of a new subscription. Second thing I would say is in an existing subscription, do the same thing with resource groups. So whenever you do provision a new resource group, make sure that it has uh, things like RBAC and policies applied to it that are necessary for your organization. And you know, a real quick example of how this could look like, if I wanted to have an enterprise-ready subscription, I could have my subscription with a couple of policies, maybe um, which services we're actually going to support in Azure. Maybe I want to exclude those giant D5 instances so people don't rack up a giant bill. And I can just restrict that right here. And then every resource group I apply later, I can add additional policies to and say maybe this team can only do certain services. Maybe this one can do different services. So you can get a lot of control, but you do need to make sure that you're implementing it at the right level at the right time. So a couple other things to make sure is that you take advantage of the platform. Obviously, you know, make sure you're taking advantage of locks. You can change them in the portal. You don't even have to write code to make these work, so really no good excuse for not using them. Uh, making sure you're looking at your audit logs now. So now that you can do that very easily, make sure you know about them. Another tool I would recommend is OMS. Digging in, taking advantage of the free tier of log analytics, and obviously if it works for you, looking at the pay tiers, uh, they do some, the product does some really amazing things, and it's basically just sitting there waiting for you to try it out. Uh, same thing, if you're building apps, take a look at Application Insights. It allows you to instrument and monitor your applications at a much more deep level under the code so you can figure out what your app's doing. Uh, Security Center, of course, what we just walked through. And there's tons of third-party tools for app and subscription monitoring. And just to wrap things up, I know we're getting a little bit short on time, but we did walk through just kind of give you a brief overview of what is governance in the cloud. Uh, we talked about what an enterprise agreement actually is. So if you've never seen one, you don't know what it is, I kind of have a good understanding of what it's for. Uh, talked about the importance of role-based access control as well as policies, basically implementing lock security and auditing, key things that you have to be enabled uh, if you have multiple people using your subscription. And of course, we walked through some best practices at the end. And I think that's it. We did want to make sure that you uh, were aware of one more final offer. Is um, We actually have an Azure governance class that's a lot of the same content we just talked about. It goes into a little bit deeper context. We also give you some really, really cool hands-on labs. So if you want to get hands-on learning RBAC, learning policies, definitely take us up on the offer. You can try our online training service for free for 30 days uh, using discount code TRIOPSGILDY. Or if you're an organization and you want to try out our services for multiple people or for your whole company for that matter, definitely reach out to us. We're open to setting up a 30-day business pilot so you can try us out for free and see if we're a really good fit for your company. Here's some, um, just a couple other classes that we offer on, on virtual or instructor-led. So we can do this on-site or virtual, as mentioned previously. So um, you can just see, take a look at that little list. And if you guys have anything that you want to contact us up for, info at, info at opsgility.com. And these is are all online, too, And right? these are all online, actually, on our um, on-demand as well. Yep. So. And you can see the whole catalog. So if you, have any, if you want to dig into the agendas more. Yes. Let us know. Info <laughs> at Opsgility. Thank you guys so much for attending today. Um, we are, are we sending out the deck? We did get a question. Uh, we're going to have it recorded. Mm -hmm. The whole session will be recorded so you can go back and watch it or you can share it out with other people and it should be available for viewing probably within optimistically another day or two. Yes. We're making a YouTube channel so you should be able to see it there. <laughs> All right. Thank you everybody. Have a great afternoon. We're going to stay on for just a few more minutes after this and uh, to answer any last-minute questions.